Welcome everybody. We'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is Extended Wear Solution, Tri-Tech Wound Care Dressing in combination with Coflex TLC two-layer compression. This is a Millican Healthcare sponsored and coordinated presentation. Now, before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Please remember to mute your lines and turn off your video cameras as this will help reduce any feedback or interruption during the presentation. Today's presentation will be followed by a live question and answer session. In the top right hand corner of this webinar platform, you will find an icon resembling a chat bubble with a question mark icon located within it. When clicked, this question submission session will appear for you to submit questions that may come up during the presentation that you would like answered. To begin, we would like to give an overview on who we are as a company. Millican Healthcare is a division of Millican & Company, a family-owned U.S.-based organization in business for more than 155 years. The first dressings were commercialized in 2007, combining the innovation of Millican & Company's textile and chemical technologies. In June 2019, a leading U.S. manufacturer of cohesive bandages and compression kits, Andover Healthcare Incorporated, was acquired. Other divisions within Millican include chemicals, floor covering, and textiles, in which products that you all are familiar with incorporate their technologies. Some examples include non-wovens found in wipes, masks, and surgical gowns, wovens found in uniforms, bandages, and wound dressings, and knits found in compression bandages and hosiery. We would like to focus today's discussion on the challenges experienced in the wound care field. One continued challenge is the management of venous leg ulcers. Chronic venous insufficiency is the seventh most common chronic disease and is the underlying cause for 95% of all leg ulcers. With the proper treatment path, venous leg ulcers, or VLUs, require a minimum of 12 weeks to heal. VLUs have a higher reoccurrence rates of up to 67%, which calls for a continued wound care and compression therapy. When in-person visits are limited due to patient mobility or safety concerns, it can be challenging to provide your patient with the care they need. Millican Healthcare can help you manage wounds and edema related to venous insufficiency despite these limitations. For optimal wound healing environment, use the standard of care for real use, wound care plus compression therapy. Millican offers products that address wound management and edema management for use together. These wound care products are offered in antimicrobial and non-antimicrobial, depending upon your needs and vary in sizes. The compression therapy is offered in two layer compression kits designed to provide optimal compression. These compression systems come in variations based on the activity level of the patient. Millikan's wound care products contain a patented technology called Active Fluid Management, or AFM for short. AFM technology is a three-part design that combines two high-performance layers through a micronit process designed to wick away excess exudate and provide superior moisture management to the wound bed and the peri-wound skin. This technology is found within the Tritec wound contact layer dressings and the ultra foam dressings. Although our wound care dressing's first mode of action is AFM technology to aid in the moisture management of complicated wounds, we do offer our select silver antimicrobial technology within Tritec Silver and Ultra Silver. Select Silver is comprised of proprietary ceramic silver ions that are released upon the interaction of sodium found within Exudate. Millikan's Select Silver has shown efficacy for up to seven days. Millikan's two-layer compression therapy, Coflex TLC, contains visual indicators on the second layer, the cohesive wrap. These visual indicators appear as ovals. When stretched to the optimal compression level, the ovals turn into circles, indicating the compression therapy is applied as intended. The indicators will appear overstretched if too much compression is applied. Coflex TLC is offered in short stretch, long stretch, and medicated offerings containing calamine or zinc within the foam, the first layer of the kit. Combining Millikan's advanced wound care products 
and optimal compression provides both moisture and edema management. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Wendy Cole, where she will dive deeper into her experience using this extended wear combination in a case series study. Wendy, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Naomi. Okay, whoop, sorry, modern technology. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Wendy Cole, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a podiatrist. I am a wound care specialist practicing in Cleveland, Ohio. I act as the director of wound care research at Kent State University College of Podiatric Medicine, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, venous insufficiency and chronic VLUs and uh, my experience utilizing the Millican product line. So we know that millions of Americans unfortunately suffer from painful open draining venous ulcers of their lower extremities. And in my private wound care practice, I'd say the majority of patients that I treat uh, do suffer from VLUs. Uh, these venous leg ulcers, otherwise known as VLUs, can cause significant clinical and economic burden to the healthcare system and really society as a whole. Uh, VLUs can take many weeks, if not months to heal. And unfortunately, they frequently frequently reoccur. So it's not uncommon to treat a patient, have the patient heal, and then uh, several months later, you know, you know, pick up the phone and the patient's on the other line and unfortunately their ulcer ha has reappeared. So it's not uncommon to see these patients suffer for many, many years with venous leg ulcers. And this can lead to isolation and depression in these patients. These wounds are heavily exudating, they can be malodorous, and a lot of patients feel like they can't go about doing Doing their activities of daily living, uh, you know, attend church or, or bingo or, or family functions because they are really very scared because of the odor and concerned uh, about really going out in public. So it again leads to isolation. So this is a significant problem that could really lead to a decrease in uh, patients' life. Uh, the venous system is composed uh, of two different systems and venous leg ulcers are typically a result of, of chronic insufficiency in the venous system and this is neither uncommon nor benign. Uh, we see that there is the abnormality in the veins of the lower leg. The superficial venous system is meant to shut blood from the surface of the leg into the deep venous system through perforating veins and then the blood flow should be uh, conducted back up to the heart and recirculated throughout the body but unfortunately malfunction of this venous system is is present with patients with chronic venous insufficiency and we see that uh, these valves become dysfunctional and, and the blood flow does not wick from the superficial system into the deep system as it should and there's a chronic uh, host of chronic conditions that can cause the dysfunction in uh, the lower extremity venous system. So we often see patients in our clinics or in our offices that have varying degrees of venous insufficiency. We can see bulging or, or varicose veins in, in patients. Uh, we see leg swelling. It could be unilateral or bilateral. We could see skin color changes and skin texture changes. And then ultimately, if these things aren't addressed, we could see skin breakdown and ulceration formation. So again, the common etiology of venous insufficiency is the reverse of the blood flow or reflux of the blood flow from the superficial system. Uh, it typically should flow from the superficial system into the deep system, but we see a reverse in that. We'll see that the deep system of veins is actually refluxing or regurgitating into the superficial system and that will lead to venous engorgement. Uh, this will also lead uh, to pooling of the blood and, and fluid in the legs, which then is transitioned into this chronic edema and, and swelling and that could 
most commonly be the first sign of venous insufficiency that we see in our patients. So really having uh, an astute eye and kind of looking for these, these markers of, of venous insufficiency is important when we're talking about prevention of venous leg ulcers. Over time with venous insufficiency, we'll see these hallmark trophic changes we sort of touched on in the previous slide. So we see that hyperpigmentation, we can see venous stasis dermatitis, where the skin becomes very inflamed, it comes, becomes very dry and scaly. We see these hemosiderin deposits, these brown kind of macules or, or changes in the skin. Sometimes they look violaceous as well. We see loss of hair. We could see skin turgor, uh, the tightness of the skin, loss of hair. Uh, we could see atrophy blanche. So we'll see some uh, lack of color in some areas. And then uh, the lipodermosclerosis, which is really where we get that hard uh, fibrotic appearing subcutaneous layer or adipose tissue layer. And ultimately, this will lead to skin dysfunction and, and skin breakdown and results in, in the venous leg ulcer formation. So there's a couple of theories uh, that are, are kind of uh, pertinent now as to why uh, venous leg ulcers will uh, develop. And really, we see that it stems from chronic venous hypertension. And uh, the thought process is that this chronic venous hypertension ultimately leads to skin breakdown and ulceration. So uh, one popular popular hypothesis is that this hypertension in the venous system leads to development of what we call a, a pericapillary thrombus or a, a a clot that forms a barrier for oxygen and then also is a nidus for inflammation. And when there's lack of oxygen or hypoxia to the tissues and there's chronic inflammation in the tissues, then the tissue starts to necrose and breaks down and therefore uh, an ulcer uh, starts to develop. There's a second uh, probably uh, a newer hypothesis, if you will, and this theory really suggests that uh, there's increased inflammation that's brought on by the cycle of chronic ischemia and reperfusion, and that's what ultimately leads to skin breakdown. So neutrophils or white blood cells uh, are reactive to this inflammatory state that we see when we have uh, the hyper um, tension in the venous system. And the uh, repeated ischemia and, and reperfusion will cause these neutrophils to release oxygen free radicals. And the oxygen free radicals will stimulate the formation of capillary cuffs that impair oxygen and trap more neutrophils, creating this vicious cycle of inflammation. And this repeated cycle of uh, ischemia and the reperfusion causes this cascade uh, of overwhelming inflammation and the body can't adjust for that. So then skin necrosis eventually occurs and then skin breakdown and ulceration. So we know uh, those of us that treat venous leg ulcers, they're notoriously heavily draining. That's probably the bane of existence when we're, we're treating these ulcers is trying to get uh, a management on that exudate level. Uh, and they can be very uh, schluff covered or covered in fibrin. Uh, again, it, it's very difficult sometimes to manage these patients because of the amount of devitalized tissue and the amount of exudate uh, they tend to uh, form. And during the inflammatory phase that we spoke about, the response in the blood vessels is such that the walls dilate and become more porous and it allows for a leakage of this protein rich fluid into the wounded area and into uh, the, the skin and, and the tissues around the wound. So that becomes engorged and then if you compound this with this venous insufficiency and this regurgitation that we talked about that's happening in uh, the venous leg uh, system of veins, it increases that exudate amount exponentially. So managing chronic exudate and preventing periwound maceration and protecting the periwound tissues is, is a constant challenge. And when we were 
learning more about the pathophysiology of wounds and why wounds stall, we understand more that the peri-wound tissue is as important, if not more important sometimes than the wound tissue itself. So we need those active keratinocytes that live on the border or in the peri-wound tissues. We need them to be healthy. We need them to be active. So the peri-wound tissue is very important. If it's macerated, those keratinocytes can't migrate uh, across the wounded tissue. I always tell people it's a gamer red rover. We want our little friends to come over and crawl across the wound. And if that peri wound tissue is not healthy or if it's oversaturated with exudate, then that won't occur and these wounds will continue to stall. So this increased amount of drainage can also contribute to the formation of a significant amount of bio burden and bio burden is kind of a basket term and it really envelops divitalized tissue, the proteus exudate that we see or dried exudate also spent white blood cells and then also can uh, also uh, have microorganisms involved in it too. And this, as we know, can be a real barrier to wound healing. Now, a lot of these wounds that we see have been open for many weeks and many months. And when we see them in our offices and our clinics, they don't necessarily have clinical signs and symptoms of infection. Uh, there might be a slight malodor because of the exudate, but we don't see purulent discharge. The patient is afebrile, and we don't see erythema or cellulitis necessarily. So they're not acutely infected, but they know we know they're contaminated with bacteria. And so you know, we, we're learning more about biofilms and how biofilms form and why biofilms block uh, the traditional uh, cycle of wound healing. And what biofilm is, it, it's actually uh, bacteria that is uh, in a construct that uh, they form these, these colonies, if you will. So free floating bacteria in plants on the surface of the wounds. It doesn't necessarily cause that infective uh, acute uh, bacterial infection, but they sit there and they start to form connections with their friends and different types of bacteria. Yeast can be involved, fungus can be involved. And when they start to form these connections, they do something called quorum sensing. So they start to share information back and forth. They can share DNA so they could kind of mutate into their own kind of subspecies. They could also share uh, the their ability to kind of fight off different antibiotics or antibiotic resistance. So once they become mature, they start to kind of spin this glycocalyx around itself. So this protein and, the, and this sugar kind of microbiome uh, that's very difficult to penetrate. And when we have a fully formed biofilm, it can really prolong that inflammatory phase and cause the wounds to stall as well. So that's a reason why a lot of these wounds have gone to healing as, as quickly as we'd like them to because they have biofilm bacteria. So we have to be very astute and, and uh, be cautious and, and careful to kind of uh, take care of this biofilm bacteria and this bacterial contamination as well. So in many cases, the cause of the ulceration can be traumatic in nature, but the healing is disrupted in one of many combinations of, of what we've just discussed here. The correction of the underlying venous hypertension is really the crux of treatment for VLUs. And uh, compression therapy is, is really king uh, for treating these types of ulcerations. Compression therapy harnesses the basic principles of physics to redo that, reduce rather that lower extremity edema and reverse that hypertension. And uh, physics was probably my least favorite course in, in undergrad and in high school, but we're gonna talk about Laplace Laplace's law and its relationship to application of compression therapy. And so the, the first uh, nidus of, of Laplace's law is that the greater the tension applied to the bandage, the greater the subband is pressure, which makes sense. The, the tighter, or the, the more pressure we put on the bandage, we're going to have more pressure in the lower extremity and the tissues uh, that are below it. In addition, sub bandage pressure is inversely proportional to the radius of the limb. Also makes sense that if a bandage is applied to a thin leg, it will result in greater pressure. Uh, finally, the greater number of layers that are applied the higher the pressure as well. So all of those things make sense in theory. But so what are the practical consequences of Laplace's law when it 
applies to compression therapy. So with a constant tension to a limb that increases in size from ankle to the leg, we'll see that the result of gradual compression and the greatest compression is at the ankle, which is where we want it to be, and it will decrease as the wrap covers more proximal, larger limb. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to reverse the pathology of the venous system of the lower leg. We're trying to milk that fluid from distal aspect of the foot and the ankle and up to the leg so it can get uh, put back into the deep venous system and then recirculate to the heart and to the lungs and, and back into the ar ar arterial system. So we want to make certain that we're using constant pressure, but this graduated compression will uh, actually occur because of the shape of the limb and that's all uh, a basic physics principle. So graduated compression can reduce blood vessel diameter, again, redirecting that blood flow centrally as it should be. It can reverse valvular dysfunction, which is very important when we're talking about chronic venous insufficiency and uh, venous reflux. It will ultimately help to reduce edema. It also improves arterial function. When we have an engorged leg with edema, it puts a lot of pressure and stress on the arterial system as well. So it could actually limit arterial flow in the lower extremity and getting rid of that edema uh, and that venous hypertension will also help with a distal arterial perfusion. Decreases level of destructive proteases, which we know are a common bad actor in, in chronic wounds. And when proteases are high, we could see it degrades the extracellular matrix or the good wound tissue. So we want to get rid of those bad proteases so that we could support uh, new uh, healthy tissue ingrowth. It reduces inflammatory cytokines, again, trying to get these wounds out of the chronic inflammatory phase, and it can aid in uh, ulcer formation, limiting ulcer formation, and it can also aid in healing ulcers that are already present in the lower extremity. So Naomi has already gone through uh, a little bit about the, the Coflex multi-layer compression bandage system, but I'm going to just touch on a couple things uh, that I think are important for those of us that are practicing wound care. Uh, first off, the, the first layer has an odor prevention, uh, odor prevention agent that helps with that malodor. Now, I had said earlier how these patients, really their quality of life is somewhat decreased because, again, these wounds are heavily exudating and there's often an odor so they don't feel like they could be around their family member or friends. Well, luckily this bandage system does have a, a, an odor prevention mechanism or agent enveloped in that first layer so it can really help uh, the patients uh, at get on with their quality of life and, and, and do the things that they love to do. The second layer also has that uh, visual indicator. So we talked about how you need to have constant compression at uh, that will form a graduated compression, constant tension rather, that'll form that graduated compression in the leg. So having this visual indicator is really important. Uh, I have students, I have residents that rotate through my clinics and we try to give them uh, a hands-on experience. And uh, this is a great way and a great tool for them to understand the amount of pressure uh, and stretch that they should apply when they're applying these, these bandages. So uh, it's a foolproof or, or or doctor proof way, if you will, uh, so that we know we're applying the compression at uh, the proper level. So again, Naomi touched a little bit uh, on the Tritex Silver dressing um, and how it, it has the proprietary uh, silver ions that help to inhibit broad spectrum infection and in anti, it's an antimicrobial. So again, it, it kind of harkens back to the fact that we want to stop the bio burden. We want to stop the biofilm bacteria uh, in their tracks as early as possible because if we stop the biofilm formation, hopefully we can then and stop again that cycle of inflammation and help to potentiate these wounds uh, back on the road to healing in the proliferative phase and, and back on uh, 
complete uh, epithelialization. So it really helps to move that excessive exudate into whatever secondary bandage. Uh, you know, this is, I've used some transfer dressings, but in my experience, this is one of the uh, most effective transfer dressings because it, it wicks that fluid away from the peri wound tissue and the wound tissue and it, it gets it into that secondary dressing and it can't wick back into the wound so it, it prevents that maceration. I always tell people uh, wounds are like houseplants. Uh, you want moist wound healing but if you would overwater a houseplant it doesn't like it. If we overwater a wound it doesn't like it and we really want to avoid that, that maceration and control that exudate the best we can. So lastly, we're going to detail a case series that I recently performed utilizing these products in my outpatient center. And it consisted of a sample of patients with moderately draining, uh, non-healing venous leg ulcers. And appropriate wound care standard of care was performed. And this included wound bed preparation, uh, debridement when, when indicated. Uh, we used the active uh, antimicrobial fluid management system, the TriTech uh, Silver that we talked about. And this was used as the primary dressing to cover the wound. And the foam was then used uh, as well as a secondary dressing, along with the Coflex uh, TLC compression bandage system was then applied to the limb. Patients were seen for weekly clinic visits. We examined the wound for size, the amount uh, of exudate. We assessed the quality of the peri wound tissue. We uh, tracked patients' pain and any adverse events were also so tracked. So in this first patient case, you'll see this is an 82-year-old female with a history of trauma uh, to the lower extremity. Uh, she does have a history also of PVD or peripheral uh, vascular disease and chronic venous insufficiency. So as I had mentioned before, oftentimes, you know, patients will have a trauma and that's what uh, gives the initial incident or, or ulceration or wound, uh, but the reason that they don't heal is because of their underlying disease, and, and that was uh, exactly what happened in this case. The patient had bumped her leg on a, an open car door, and you can see the significant injury that ensued, and a lot of these patients have a thin, fri friable skin as they get older, and so just a really, you know, incidental injury really can cause a, a severe wound in the lower extremity. So she had been treating this at home with some antibiotic ointment and it, it just wasn't progressing and this wound had actually been there for uh, over a month and a half before she came to the wound care center. And you can see um, uh, on her visit one, we have a wound uh, of the lower extremity that's uh, three centimeters by 1.4 centimeter by 0 0.3 centimeter. So in order to help with the exudate and the pain and, and the edema that she had in her lower extremity, we decided to go ahead and use the Tritex Silver and the multi-layer compression system. And that was kept intact and dry for, for a full week. And the patient uh, came back. And I should mention initially her pain level on uh, the vast scale was five. She came back the next week and we unwrapped it and we saw what well, there was the wound measurements didn't change a, a great deal in just that week, but we were able to manage her exudate quite well. There was increased granulation tissue uh, at the base of the wound and there was no malodor and there was no uh, peri wound uh, maceration or irritation at all. And at this point, uh, the patient's pain level had also decreased uh, to, a, to a zero at this point in time. So we continued with that therapeutic regimen and used the TriTech with the uh, multi-layer compression and you can see she came back the next week and, and now we've had some progress in wound healing as far as uh, the changes in the diameter of the wound. So the wound had decreased uh, to 2.8 centimeters by 1.1 centimeter and had completely filled in where we had had some depth at 0 0.3. Now the wound was flush with uh, the peri wound tissues. The other uh, thing I always say to, to patients and, and to my students is that epithelial cells are, are real lazy. They don't want to go down valleys. They don't want to go up peaks. They just want to go straight across. So you really have to fill in the depth of the wound so that it's flush with that peri wound tissue to really accelerate uh, epithelialization. So this is a wound that's definitely on the road to healing. So we went ahead and continued with the regimen. You can see the picture uh, two weeks later and the wound is really 
almost healed. It has a thin layer of epithelial coverage. Uh, there's no odor. There's there's scant drainage. The edema has been controlled quite well with her. So in this case, even though that wound is, is almost healed, I, I usually end up putting the patient in compression for at least a week or two later because notoriously these things will open back up if, if we try to take the patient out of compression too long or too soon rather. Um, so I would always err on the side uh, of leaving the patient compressed for an additional week or two after we really see uh, that there's indication that the wound is healed. And we saw you know, one more week of compression therapy, the patient came back and the wound was completely healed and, and covered with nice new uh, healthy tissue. So here's patient two. This is a 92-year-old female, and she had a traumatic ulcer of the lower extremity. Again, another trauma case. I believe uh, this patient had a fall, if I remember correctly. And you can see her past medical history. She has venous disease. Uh, she had been treating this at home, and, and it just kept getting worse. It was very, very heavily exudated. You can see it's quite a large lesion that's covering uh, the anterior shin area right below the the knee. Uh, when she came in, the, the measurements were 9.5 by 4.2 by 0 0.4. I mean, there's some slight peri wound maceration. There's a lot of devitalized tissue in the peri wound, and there was this foul odor, although there did not appear to be any clinical signs of infection. So decided to use uh, the Tritec Silver and the uh, Coflex multi-layer compression on her and saw her back the next week. And you can see the distal aspect of the wound where we had that really irritated and, and angry uh, superficial tissue that was present uh, has resolved and, and new skin has formed over, over that area. The, the traumatic uh, sort of laceration or, or deeper wound centrally uh, is still present, but the wound diameter had changed significantly. We didn't see any of the peri wound maceration that we had seen before. There was no odor and we saw some beefy red granulation tissue starting uh, to form on the periphery of the wound. So we know that this wound is now active and kind of uh, moving in the in the right way. Uh, so we continued with uh, the tritech and multi-layer compression. And you can see her subsequent follow-up on 819. The wound had closed down significantly in, in just about a month of therapy and no peri wound maceration uh, and the wound base was very clean, uh, scant drainage, no infection. Her pain level went from the initial pain level of the nine down to zero quite quickly. And uh, on 822, we see that there is a a stable uh, eschar or scab overlying that area, continued to wrap the patient at multi-layer compression for, for two weeks so that that uh, area also resolved and, and the patient did quite well. Patient case three, 70-year-old male with a lower extremity venous leg ulcer. He also has a history of diabetes and arterial disease. Um, so, you know, he's kind of like the triple whammy. Uh, he's got a lot of comorbidities that, you know, really can compound his healing. Uh, he had been treating this at home with some gauze and tape, uh, came in, we see him on the 15th of July. We see some edema. There is again some odor coming from the area, but really no clinical signs and symptoms of uh, infection. So use our same regimen on him, came back the following week. Uh, the wound had decreased in size by about a half in, in both ways. So that was kind of a rapid change for him. Drainage had decreased quite a bit. There again is no peri wound maceration. There's new evidence of, of epithelialization all around the, the periphery of the wound. And the patient's uh, pain level went down to zero at this point in time. And so we rewrapped him in, in as little as two weeks weeks, we are able to get this pretty significant wound to heal completely with this current regimen. So this is our fourth and final case. It's an 87-year-old female, four-month history of a venous leg ulcer. Uh, she's psoriasis and venous disease. Uh, so again, she has a couple of strikes against her that can limit her ability to heal. She had been uh, treating uh, with uh, calcium alginate bandages. She had seen, been seen by another clinician and, and she wasn't getting anywhere. So uh, after four months, she decided to seek a second opinion. And this is what the wound looked like when she 
first came into uh, the practice, we see a lot of peri wound maceration. The calcium alginate bandages weren't able to manage her exudate uh, effectively, so she was getting a lot of a maceration. There was quite a, a bit of an odor coming, and she was still having a lot of drainage, and she wasn't able to manage that, and she was changing her bandage uh, several times a day. And unfortunately, with her insurance and how things go, you know, she was running out of bandages and having to pay out of pocket because insurance will only pay for uh, one bandage change a day for, for an alginate in a wound like this. So we then again put her back on, on the regimen with the Tritec and the compression dressing and uh, saw her back the following week. And lo and behold, amazingly to, to everyone in the center, the wound was covered at this point in time with a thin layer of epithelial tissue. We were able to really control that edema and control that drainage. She didn't have to change the dressing multiple times a day. We, we really just changed this dressing once a week and there was no peri wound maceration. Can she you to wrap her again for an additional two weeks just to make certain that uh, that new skin was protected so it really could toughen up and she went on to complete healing of this wound that had been present unfortunately for four months without resolution in as, in as little as uh, three weeks with this current regimen. So in conclusion and in summary we know that uh, these VLUs uh, tend to be moderately uh, exudative and can benefit from the Tritex Silvers, a primary dressing in combination with the Coflex TLC two-layer compression therapy. Uh, peri wound maceration was controlled throughout the course of the treatment in all of these patients. Exudate management was achieved as well, so we were able to wick that exudate away from the wounded tissue and into the secondary bandage and that is what helped promote wound progression into healing. Edema was controlled and that malodor was lessened over the course of therapy. And also this led to decreased pain levels and patients did not have any problems with uh, their dressing changes either. Uh, a lot of times some of the secondary dressings can stick to the wound. We did not find that to happen with the Tritex Silver, did not adhere to the wounded tissue or the peri wound tissue. So patients pain level was uh, significantly decreased. Patients reported an overall decrease in pain uh, throughout the course of therapy and patients were able to resume resume rather their normal activities and the coflex uh, compression system really stayed intact and stayed in place very well for these patients without slipping, which we know is somewhat of a complaint for patients sometimes that we put in multi-layer compression. So we know that edema causes alterations in endothelial tissue, and this really can cause a, a complex cascade of really bad events that lead to uh, chronic inflammation and, and wounds stalling in, in the healing uh, cascade. And neutrophils become activated. They can adhere to capillary walls, and this is what creates that ischemia, reperfusion injury, and these oxygen-free radicals that subsequently uh, damage tissues and, and cause uh, the venous leg ulcers to uh, form. And this inflammation has to be controlled and this hypertension needs to, to be controlled to reverse the hypoxia and reduce inflammation and uh, really try to rid the tissues of these uh, proteases that become excessive and break down good uh, good tissues and, and good wound uh, good wound cells. So compression therapy facilitates the removal of lower extremity edema. It helps to detach the white blood cells uh, from the endothelium. It decreases that inflammation. As we improve perfusion, the tissue environment stabilizes and tissue fibrosis decreases and, and granulation tissue and healthy uh, wound tissue, extracellular matrix tissue then improves. So compression therapy uh, is very effective in uh, healing ulcers, but not 
uh, all ulcers will heal from compression therapy alone. Uh, there is a component that needs to be addressed with the bio burden and the biofilm and the bacteria in the wound. So the Tritec Silver proved to be an effective primary wound dressing to control bio burden and bacterial biofilm. And it also helped us manage that exudate by wicking uh, the drainage away from the peri wound tissues and into that secondary dressing and prevent maceration. Here are some references, uh, you know, if you wanted to look back and I'd be happy to provide those for anybody who's interested. And uh, that concludes my presentation. And I think at this point in time, we're gonna open up the floor to any questions you might have. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Thank Dr. You, Dr. Cole. Dr. Cole. I'm sure we sure all enjoyed you walking, walking through those, those cases. cases. And we're fairly, fairly impressed, impressed by the combination of the two dressings that you used. Looks like we have a few questions that have come through and we encourage those that are on this webinar to use the live event Q&A feature, which is located up at the top right hand corner. Again, it looks like a comment bubble with a question mark within it, so you can submit questions there. All right, so the first question that we have coming through Dr. Cole, was there a higher compliance rate in this combination of products due to the increased comfort level or reduced pain? Yes, I, I did not have any patient remove their dressing and uh, that's a win <laughs> in, in my patient population. Uh, they tend to be cantankerous and sometimes remove their dressing even though they're not supposed to. But uh, yeah, I think patient tolerated this combination of dressing therapy quite well so that enabled them to be more adherent to the treatment plan. I had no uh, incidents of, of slipping or the bandage, you know, coming loose or the patient having discomfort and removing the bandage. So uh, my patients tolerated it very well and, and better than some of the other compressive therapies that I've used in the past. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Yes. And we have another question that has come through. What was the pain previ previously experienced caused by? Was it caused by edema, skin irritation? Yeah, so I think it's a combination of certain things. Um, you know, these are large wounds that have been present, so they're open wounds. So, of course, our body has uh, pain is, is kind of like a, a warning signal, right, when we have an injury. So that's not an unusual to have pain. But then, again, these uh, wounds are inflamed, and, and there's tissue necrosis that's involved. We talked about some of the pathology behind uh, the breakdown of the tissue uh, and the ulcer formation. So we see that these tissues are hypoxic, leads to fibrosis or necrosis and ulceration and this chronic inflammation all leads to a very irritable uh, tissue uh, and uh, that also can lead to a lot of pain. Sometimes too, that exudate, if we're not managing wound exudate and it's able to sit uh, around the wound and on the tissues, it can burn. I mean, it, it's almost like a very caustic uh, fluid. So wicking it away, I think also helped with decreasing patient's pain. And then, you know, having the, the compression that stayed on and stayed put uh, and getting rid of that edema also helped significantly reduce the patient's pain. So it was a combination uh, of several factors that I think ultimately uh, led to what we felt was a, a pretty significant reduction in patient's pain. Thank you. Of course. And we have another question that's come through. With this combination of the products, did the wounds heal quicker than the standard 12 weeks reported for average VLU healing? Yeah, so all of these wounds uh, did heal quite a bit more quickly than in 12 weeks. I think in the longest uh, case, it was a two month uh, healing process. So that was significantly quicker than, than the standard 12 weeks that we see typically to heal a venous leg ulcer. So I think that also kind of harkens back to the ability for the patients to tolerate the dressing combination and remain adherent to the treatment plan. So a more uh, adherent patient, uh, the more quickly we can get these wounds to heal. So I, I think, you know, this all worked together to, to help facilitate a rapid healing of these chronic wounds. Thank you. 
And again, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them through the live event Q&A platform and we'll be sure to have them answered for you. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> and also, if you have any product specific or company specific questions, we have someone on the line to answer those questions as well. And you can always follow up with our email afterwards for any additional questions that you may not want answered while on this live portion. That option is available. All right, looks like we have another question that has come through. Great. And it's specific to showering. So the attendee is asking what precautions are needed during showering? And I think that's in relation to it being a seven day wear time. Right. Yeah, so unfortunately or fortunately, uh, these patients are not able to get this bandage wet. So showering is very tricky. Now, if a patient is fairly functional and, and they could apply like a cast cover and typically you buy find these cast covers at your local pharmacy that cost about $25. I tell them they can go get that and they can, they have a, a suction device around the lower leg that will keep the bandage dry during showers. But I, you know, a lot of patients aren't as mobile and, and they don't have the ability to, to put the, the covering on and I'm concerned that they might slip in the shower if they were to wear something like that. So I really just tell them uh, to, do a, a bird bath or a sponge bath uh, and, and, and try to avoid getting into the shower. So, you know, that that's a common complaint uh, among the patients that you put this on. But, uh, you know, if, if again, they're adherent and they, they follow the treatment regimen, they get this healed and then they could take as long a shower as they want afterwards. So I, I typically recommend a bird bath or a sponge bath for these patients. Thank you. Sure. And we have another question that's come through asking, do you need the extra long size compression offering? I don't typically use the extra long. Yeah, so I, I mean, you guys could probably answer how much of that you sell versus the, the regular uh, length, but I, I, I find most patients are accommodated well with the, the standard compression. Gwen, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that product related? Okay, so we have a question. So you mentioned using the combination of the Tritex Silver dressing as the primary dressing and the Coflex TLC as the compression component. Can you give any insight as to what you were using as that secondary since the Tritex is more of a transfer or a wicking dressing? Yeah, so I was also using the Millican foam dressing as the covering for the Tritex, so to help with absorption. Thank you. Of course. Okay, and we have another question that's come through. Would you recommend the TLC to prevent wounds or is regular 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury enough? 
Yeah, so I typically don't use compression wraps to, you know, prevent ulcers. Um, usually we try to get the patients into some compression garment, be it, you know, a Velcro closure, zip closure, or pull-on type of compression garment. And that's a great point, you know, when we get these wounds to heal, unfortunately, so many recur because we don't get the patient uh, into a compression garment or the patient is non-adherent to using the compression garment. And we really have to educate our patients that compression is key. Um, compression is for life. And if they don't use their compression garment after these, they heal these wounds, uh, there is a <laughs> likelihood that they'll recur. So, I mean, you can, you can use the compression bandages, the multi-layer compression system to treat edema uh, until you get the patients into a garment. But the ultimate goal when we're dealing with non-wounded tissue, especially, you know, in, in my practice is to um, get them into a compression garment they can wear for daily use and they can remove that to sleep. They can remove that to shower, but ultimately non-wounded lower extremities with venous insufficiency should be in some sort of compression garment versus a compression bandage. Thank you. Now, if you have a patient case that comes in where they do not have an open wound, but drainage is still occurring, edema is still present, would you still use the combination of the two products? Yes, yeah, because you want to get that edema under control, and especially when there's drainage. So there's not a grossly large wound per se that you can measure, but there's small, tiny little openings in the skin that, that's causing that drainage. So in that instance, yes, typically we'll measure the patients if they don't have a compression garment they're using at home. We'll measure the patient for a compression garment. Uh, we order from a third party DME supplier um, that sends the garment if indicated through insurance directly to the patient. We'll go ahead and put the patient into a multi-layer compression uh, bandage uh, and then see the patient back the following week. And oftentimes, and as that little period of time, uh, insurance will cover compression garment. If we see that the edema is under control and the drainage is under control, then we try to uh, put the patient in their compression garment and educate them on the need to compress daily. Thank you. Sure. Well, we have a question coming through on what are the different ways to wrap the Coflex two layer dressings? So for wrapping all our compressions, um, whether they're the short stretch or long stretch or they're the dry or moist, um, application is the same. We try to um, instruct in three steps, the foot, the ankle and the leg. Um, so, you know, starting at the uh, fifth digit at the base of the foot, we spiral wrap around the foot. We will do one figure eight around the ankle and then spiral up the leg. And that is the first layer. The second layer is, is wrapped identically, ex with one exception that you're going to put, uh, you're going to apply two figure eights around the ankle with the second figure eight uh, covering the heel. But application is the same for all the products. Thank you, Gwen. I've only got a few more minutes left of the webinar, people. So if you have any questions that you're itching to ask, now is your time. If not, we'll have to follow up by email. Speak now or forever hold your question. <laughs> yes.
Okay, well, if there aren't any further questions, then we greatly appreciate all of you for taking time out of your very busy days to join us during this webinar and special thanks to Dr. Cole for going through some impressive case series. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And again, thanks for everyone for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Yes, thank you. And I'm sure there will be a follow up email with further contact information and additional information on where you can find more about the products and um, for both the wound care and the compression side. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.